Hey folks, you're welcome to another episode of Founders Connect. Here I have conversations with amazing entrepreneurs in Africa. On today's episode, I'm going to be having a conversation with Godwin Tom, the founder of Music Business Africa and I Imagine Africa. Hi Godwin. I manage. I manage. Yeah, I manage Africa. Corrected. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm, I'm doing really good. glad to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yes. Okay, so let's get into the video. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I'm PC Timmy, a change maker, professional, and creative who is passionate about growing people and growing businesses. Like, comment, subscribe to my channel, and please always share my videos. It promises to always be impactful and insightful. So I usually like to start my conversations with just like learning about you. So how, what was what's your background like? How where did you grow up? What schools did you go to? Family? Just anything or any stories that you can tell us. Hmm. Um. I was born in Lagos. I'm from Aquarium State. Okay. Uh, I've lived in, I don't know, 13 different places. In Nigeria uh, or across the world? In Nigeria. Um, most of them in Lagos. So oh, okay. moved around a lot. So most of my life I've lived in Ikoi, but uh, we lived in BQs because of the work my parents did. So my mom was a steward, my dad was a driver, a chauffeur. Mm. Really a driver, chauffeur. Is a, <laughs> you know, yeah, to say. So, you know, really a driver. But um, so we moved around a lot. So depending on who, my mom worked in the U.S. embassy. Right. Uh, so depending on who is shipped in as an attaché, you know, she was shipped in as right. help. Um, and so we moved around a lot. Uh, but you know, I've lived in Ajegunle. I've lived in Mount Twelve. I've lived in Obalende. I've lived in Enugu. So like I've a lived serious. In, Lagos boy. Yeah. Um, so I've been around quite often. So that's that's it. Uh, what else do you need for background? <laughs> <laughs> what, what would you say is like your most memorable memory about your childhood? Hmm. It was. Hmm. There are a lot of things. I had a pretty good and healthy childhood. Um, but I would say. I'd say going home because. Up until primary five, I came first okay. in class. So my dad had this tradition that when you come first, they buy a whole chicken and you kill it yourself. <laughs> yeah. Every it's, single time. It's every single time. So, but in primary five, I came second. Um, I was beaten by a girl named Miriam. You still remember her name? I remember everything. Uh, so we're literally, it was literally three of us. It was either me, my friend called Jimmy, or Miriam. So uh, that was first, second, third. So Miriam beat both of us. I came second. And so my dad had taken the day off work, you know, um, bought the chicken, bought the drinks. And um, yeah, he was quite disappointed. I think the re his reaction was reflex because he gave me a knock on my head Oof. for coming second. Um, but that's the only time my father ever hit me. So I guess it was just reflex. He was just he was so disappointed. His body just went ah. <laughs> so yeah, that was that that was outside the knock. That was a fun memory. Mm, what was it fun? Uh, outside the knock, I mean, it was fun. It was a fun being able to be being reward. I taught. I was taught early to be rewarded mm. for 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 things for the work I do. So you know, you know, you want to be that guy. And by the way, you 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 eat the chicken you kill. So that's yours. So everybody gets, everybody chicken. else, yes, everybody else shares theirs, but you, you have that. That's like, you know, <laughs> um, and so it was, that was something I remember really well. I think another one is my father telling me, um, oh, actually, even co connected to that, because I was trying to impress my dad, when he got upset, then I told him, ah, I'm going to beat the girl. And my father looked at me and said, even if I'm dead, if you touch a woman, I will rise up. And I will beat you, <laughs> right? And you know, so those types of conversations used to be this guy that would tell you if, if you're working, even if it's your mom, mm. move her to the other side mm. of the road. That's so those memories are things that that was stuck with me. Um, but I mean, there are a lot. But uh, I'm glad for my dad. Awesome. So outside like primary school, I know this getting first. What was like secondary school and university like for you? Um, I kind of fell off in high school, in secondary school. So there were. It wasn't like I was just angry with a lot of things mm. and I wasn't paying attention. And then we moved to, that was the period where we were in Ajibunle. And I was angry for a lot of things that we've moved past and right. I don't want to bring them back. But I was very angry with a lot of people and it affected me, affected school. Um, I just stopped being serious. Uh, and then by the time I so was. So no in, more chicken for you at that time? No more chicken. <laughs> uh, by the time I was in 
GSS3, I started getting back into it, but I was sort of the bad boy in school who was intelligent. It was, <laughs> it was weird. Like I pass my exams, I do what I need to do, but I just, I was unruly. Mm. That's the best way to put it. Uh, so, but by SS3, I was assistant head boy. I was forced to calm down and you know, things just, secondary school was sort of a breeze for me. Yeah. And uni? Um, so I was in UNN and then I left in my first year. Why? Um, many reasons. One of it was cultism, was, was right. unbelievable. And I was living with a particular set of uh, boys who didn't actually force me to join them. You know, <laughs> they, they kept trying. But my, my reaction to them was always, you know, this meeting you do in the bush. If you do it in the school hall, I'll join. <laughs> right. If we did in the school hall, I'll join. But I, I don't want to wear suits and go to the bush to do mm -hmm. any any type of meeting. And they were like, "Oh, we're first class, second class, upper. We don't, you know, we don't fight in school." I was like, "Then do your meeting in the school hall." Um, so that didn't they didn't really force. It was the other cult groups that were really really on my case. Like I couldn't eat, right. um, I couldn't wear some of the clothes I took to school because luckily for some guy called Ollie. He was like a guardian angel. So all he did this thing where if you wear a wrong color, he would like take it off. You know, you wear a color, <laughs> take it off. So I, I kept doing that till I couldn't wear literally all the things I took to school. But the other reason why was I went home for it was a holiday and I went home and you know I overheard my mom struggling to raise money for my brothers. She right. had borrowed some money and he came and was like, I have projects. So she had to go borrow more money mm. to send to him. And I was like, I don't want to put her through that for me. Like, so I told her there was massive cultism in school and you know, they were targeting me and I couldn't go back. So I, I didn't go back. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job and, and that's how, but I went back to school. I paid my way through university later on. Amazing. So I went to Lasso. Okay, so what was like, what was your first job at? And then how did you from there get into like the music business? My first job, I was assistant to to Taj Din Ogunshola of Impact 8.5. Uh, it's a marketing agency. It was in Ikoi in 2006. Long time. 2006, 2005, 2005. <laughs> um, I, was, I was his assistant and then kind of grew into, he, I, I saw him writing proposals. So I used to edit his proposals. Mm. He made a lot of mistakes. Taj, you, you made a lot of mistakes. <laughs> he made a lot of mistakes in his, in his uh, proposals. And so I, I used to correct them. And then one day I just told him I could write one, you know. So right. I wrote the 20, 2006 Polo Club tournament proposal. I wrote that. So I got them Air France, a few people. So that nice. was fun, you know. Yeah. And then I left there and went to a sports marketing company, VGC. And then from there I went to, I worked in a, in a printing company. And then from there I worked in a magazine company with La Tonta Ricoca. Mm -hmm. And then... He owned a marketing company and a marketing agency. And then from there, I worked with the former at Fruition. Then the music industry. <laughs> uh, what got me in? Osage. Um, How so? I was bored. Mm. I was really bored. I was PR and marketing manager for Fruition. And I was, I just, you know, I was, I was so bored that I started going to Nighthouse to record music. Um, not that the job was bad, but it was just, I just felt like if I stayed too comfortable, in that space, I wouldn't move right. in life. I was 21, I was looking for, for a challenge and I felt like I was just stuck. Yeah. So, um, nice job. We had clients, British <laughs> Telecoms, Nokia, Deola Sego. We're doing all right. But I was really like, I just felt like I'm, I felt stuck. Yeah. So I told Osage, Osage used to manage me when I was an artist. So she, she and I spoke and I said to her, look, I want to go. I want to, you know, I'm, I'm happy to manage artists. She was like, okay. So two weeks later, she was like, are you still bored? That's literally <laughs> what Osagi said to me. Are you still bored? And I was like, yeah. yeah. She said, okay, I'll send you some songs. Uh, uh, there's an artist I want you to meet. So she sent me MI's music, um, Chant Down Babylon and Crowd Mentality. Mm. And I was like, I need to meet this guy. Uh, we set up a meeting. So I was working in VI and we met at... Uh, the Galleria, right. Silverbird Galleria. And so, but there was a problem. MI was looking for an assistant. Nothing and Osage didn't hear it properly. So Osage <laughs> told me manager. So imagine MI 
coming into a meeting and this assistant that he was about to hire is telling him, all right, so what's your plan for the next four years? What are you trying to achieve? What resources do you have now? You know, and he just, he was very quiet in the first meeting and I didn't know why, I didn't understand it. I was like, ah, with the, person, with the kind of music I heard, you shouldn't be this dumb. Yeah. So he, <laughs> but he was, he was confused Ouch. because he was, um, those were my initial thoughts. Emma is anything but dumb. Mm -hmm. um, and so he called me later that evening and he said he thinks that there's a misunderstanding. Uh, and I was like, I'm not anybody's assistant, I'm sorry. <laughs> so he goes, no, 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 I want us to meet again, let's talk. So we met the second time, he told me what he wanted to do. Um, I think this, after the second meeting, I quit my job the next day. Mm. Yeah. What was it about that meeting that made you say, yes, this is exactly what I want to do now? I said, I asked him, can you pay me? He said, no. I asked him, can the label pay me? He said, no. I asked him, like, do you have any money, <laughs> like any resources? He said no, that he's literally starting from scratch. But then he said, but you see, the thing is, at this time he was 21. Okay. Um, and he said, uh, I'm 21, I'm 27. He was 27 at the time I was 21. And he said, um, I'm 27, I had to leave school. My scholarship wasn't continued, so I had to leave the States. Um, I can't get a job at a bank. I can get a decent job that I want. This is all I have. If this doesn't work, I'm effed. Mm. And, you know, I was like, okay, let me, we'll talk. Let me think. I went home and I was just thinking, like, okay, so I was bored. That was all. <laughs> like, this is just too much. Like, this is somebody's life. Like, it became real. Yeah. Um, and I wrote, I wrote a text to MI to tell him, you know what, bro, maybe this is not, <laughs> not, right now. We're not for each other. I wrote it, I think I wrote three drafts and then got out my laptop and typed my resignation letter. Like, I never sent him the messages, <laughs> but I just typed my resignation, resignation letter and sent it in the next day. That and took it so far. Yeah. Interesting. So just before we like continue on that lane, um, you mentioned that Osaga used to manage you and used to go to rec record music. I, used so, like, to, I, I was a musician at some point. Tell us about your own music career. Ah, no, <laughs> no. Um, did, you, did you ever do anything with it? I did. I mean, we played on radio a few times. Shout out Osage. Uh, shout out Dan Foster. God rest his soul. Um, we, we did performance. It was a gospel group oh, called okay. Seventh Seal. Um, we did, you know, we did okay. Um, it was owned, we were signed to a label called Testify Records, um, owned by Alex Yangs at the time. I think he currently manages Watcher now. Um, and he was, you know, he was very enthusiastic about all the things we wanted to do. Kel was my label, label mate. Right. Uh, and, you know, we did some good music. This don't work, but, you know, I don't think they'll ever come out again. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was a period in my life. And from time to time, I, I have put out music. I put out one with Ice Prince right. uh, some time ago, and I did one on my 30th. So that's as far as it goes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you managed MI. Can you name some people, some other artists that you managed? I just sound like I'm bragging. Please brag. Um, that's, that's the whole point of the question. Um, M.I., Ice Prince, Jesse Jags, Show Them Camp, Rooftop MCs, Iris, um, One Day Cole, Whiskey, David O. I didn't manage David O. I helped release his music. Um, Young Six, Bears, I uh, did a brief management for Cavemen, um, Solid Star. Jeez, there's, there's, there's a lot of people. That's amazing. Um, th there's many questions that I have just about like all of these people, but like in terms of like management, right? Um, how do you know that this artist is going to be big? And what's like the secret that you're like, okay, I, I like your music and I want to really help you get there. So what are the things that you do or look out for? So it's like, it's kind of two in one, like what kind of artists do you look out for and say, okay, I'm going to work with you because I see this straight. And then what do you really do for them that sort of helps them, you know, jumpstart their career? There are different reasons. Um, I, I took on Wandy's, Wandy Cole's management because it was a challenge. Everyone told me not to do it. Mm. Everyone. What were their reasons? I mean, the, a lot of what I found later on was just stuff they heard. You know, maybe 
they didn't really understand him as a person, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but I just felt like he can't be that bad. Nobody is that much of a lost cause right. for people to just give up on like that. And I realized that he was dealing with a lot himself. And one day is actually stronger than a lot of people think, you know. So building, working with him showed me it was more of a challenge. But working, I'm glad I took that challenge because working with him showed me some of the darkest parts that he has had to he has had to overcome mm. to be one day cool you know so um i think there are different reasons there are some for, well most importantly the person has to have talent because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, i'm a talent manager you know so if, if there's, there's no, no talent then, no you know, okay. so that's the first thing the second thing is um that you have to be if you bring me on as a manager you have to understand that i'm not your assistant i'm not your staff Right, so you're bringing me on because there's some value mm. that I bring to the table, and if you, if we don't agree, we can't move forward. Right. So you have to be someone who at least listens to reason. Right. I'm not saying I'm going to tell you what to do, but my job is to present the options mm. and advise you on the best option. And if my advice is never taken, then I don't work. see why yeah. why I'm there. So usually you don't know this until you start. Mm. So talent is the first thing. And then how teachable is the artist? Is the person willing to listen or learn? Um, I've worked with artists who takes advice from everybody else but professionals. They don't listen to <laughs> lawyers, they don't listen to management, they don't listen to anybody but you know, sisters, brothers, mom, uncles, friends. friends. Everybody is giving business advice except the people who are supposed to be giving the business. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, in those types of situations, I walk away. Interesting. What would you say has been the biggest challenge so far in your career in the music business uninformed people mm. um, everybody can learn things you know ignorance is not a sin stupidity is <laughs> right so if if somebody is if someone doesn't know genuinely doesn't know that's not a bad thing because yeah. they can learn if someone is aware and still chooses and I think one of the problems we have is that there's more ignorance than stupidity, but it's there. And I think that ignorance, once fixed, conversations become easy to yeah. have. Whether it's with a lawyer, it's an artist manager, or an artist himself or herself, it becomes easier to, ma to, to, to get things done when people are not... Like, if you give someone a contract now, they panic. It's like... You could all be laughing right now, and the moment you pull out a contract, it's as if you came to fight. Mm. You know, so all those types of issues are things that need to change, and it, it's been a challenge for for me. But I think the other one is the fact that a lot of people that should be a lot of people that should be mentoring people are fighting the people they should be mentoring, and that's mm. that's the saddest part for me. Interesting, but that's like in the industry itself. Is that also, or is that also like part of like your own work? Yeah, stuff I've experienced. Yeah, people who I've looked up to, you know, I felt like I could reach out to to say, mm. look, I have this challenge. You know, I found out that we're, we're beefing me the entire time. <laughs> you know, all this time I was doing like boom, like, boom, like, boom. I'm coming to you for learning. You know, I was pissing them off. Apparently, mm. I didn't know. So, um, and it pops up in meetings where right. your name comes up and they're sitting there. And you know they shut you down, and they tell people what they really, really think. Mm -hmm. And luckily, I have more friends as well, so those things usually come back. Interesting. Um, of all these artists that you mentioned, which would you say has been the has had the has been the biggest challenge that career and taking them from like grand zero to where you took them to? Which of them was like this I, one? You're like, I, I can't believe that we did this. It's one day cool. One day cool. But I did believe we could do it because mm. it's one day cool. You know what I mean? When I took Wande Colon in 2016, as I said, nobody wanted me to yeah. do that job. Everybody said no. And I remember sitting with him and talking through what we wanted to do. Actually, his lawyers employed me. Employed me. Right. Um, and I sat there with a five-year plan. I gave them, this is what we're going to do. This is where we're going. By year three, we were seeing results, yeah. like concrete financial results. So that was, that was a big big one for me because it was it was evident that it's possible mm. and which was the easiest the easiest i wouldn't none of the artists have been easy i think every artist comes with their own challenge um but who has been most who has been the most what's the word the one i could relate with the most mm. when i'm having conversations it would be bez and show them camp 
um, Shodem Camp and I have been managing Shodem Camp for 11 years. <laughs> so they're literally my brothers. Uh, Bez and I have, like we can talk through things. Like I no longer manage a lot of artists, but yeah. Bez and I still talk. Like we still connect and we still talk about things we're about to start doing together. Right. So that kind of relationship made it a lot easy to to deal with and manage. Yeah. In your experience, for people who are looking to get into the music business as, as managers, right, what are the things that they don't know and they would actually find out when they get there, you're like, oh yes, I, music business is fun and it's money and it's travel and fun. all of that stuff. Well, yeah. That's the thing. That's the first <laughs> thing. It's not fun. Uh, the assumption, I mean, you see the traveling. I t I'll give you a typical example. So when people talk about the music industry and talk, talk about managers, they always reference entourage, mm -hmm. right? And so they tell me, you know, but E goes out with, with Vince. You know, um, why why can't I go out with my artist and party? And I'm like, you're watching the wrong thing. If you pay attention to the show, look at what happens to E in the morning. Right. Right. E has missed meetings. He's missed calls. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, Ari Gold is upset because there was an email that was expecting or it's supposed to be somewhere. Something went wrong because he That's let funny. go. Yeah. That is the problem. <laughs> you, you are, the, the artist can be seen having so much fun. You can also be seen having fun. But you must show up when you're required to show up. Mm -hmm. and, and so when people watch that show, they always look at the fun. They forget the other parts of, of the job. And that is, that is the first thing I always tell people. It's not fun. The second thing is you won't have a life for a while. You know, to when? At what point do you begin to have a life? When you begin to produce results. Mm. Because that's when the artist begins to trust you. So if mm. you're not available... I remember February 2019, I flew into London. One day had a tour. He didn't even know I was coming. But I was about to close a deal for him with Live Nation. So I flew in and I went, I showed up. I literally got to the airport, took an Uber straight to Nunham. And I got there, he was so happy to see me, we laughed, we talked. And I didn't see him for another two weeks. Like I literally just saw him when we were going to shows. <laughs> and I just showed up and he didn't expect me to be there. And I remember someone saying, you know, why don't you hang? And I said, because my artist knows that even yeah. if he doesn't see me, I'm working. Right. So by the time I called him to say, yo, I have a call, you are, you're on ENDS Festival. You know, yeah. that, so it doesn't matter anymore. So I think, you get to that point where you've created, you've consistently created results that your artist begins to trust you a lot more mm. and then you're able to breathe, mm. right? Then you're able to get a team to say, okay, I may not be able to follow you to the show today, but you have your own guys. My own guy will be there waiting for you, mm. ensuring things are done. I need to sort out a doctor's appointment. I need to travel. I need to do other things. And it, it, that trust comes from, from work done. Mm. So what other things are you going to mention? You mentioned like, hey, it's not fun. Mm. Um, you wouldn't have a life for a while. What are yeah. that Um You'll be like the bank cashier. You know the cashier in the bank, you see a lot of money, but it's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, that's that's something because you have to, you have to learn to you will get tempted. Mm. You know? Um, and if you if your artist becomes successful, you're going to have access to quite a lot of doors. And the tendency to take advantage of your artist yeah. will become more glaring, and yeah. you know. And so you need a really good moral compass to keep you straight. There are a lot of managers that will lose their way. Uh, and then the other thing is, don't get carried away. A lot of people will get carried away. Um, you will think you are an artist. You will think that they. Pe sometimes people talk about the women that throw them. They don't want you, <laughs> right? They throw themselves at you to get to the artist. Mm. And so, you know, when you, when you realize that, it makes it easy for you. Uh, I think the last thing I will say on this one is it will humble you, right? Especially when you meet, when you, when you work with an artist from start and then they become successful and you may not see eye to eye anymore. Mm. Or maybe you as, an, as a manager, you're not growing, growing, right? And your artist is getting to a point where they need people who can take care of certain things that you are not delivering. It's, it's going to be very painful. Mm. And people who you felt were your friends to stop talking to you. When I stopped managing MI, a lot of brand managers stopped talking to me. 
When I started managing Whiskey, they became my friends again. <laughs> when I stopped managing Whiskey, when it's Whiskey and I stopped working, they stopped. That was when I was like, ah, something's off. And I think that's some, a lot of, I, you have to be in it to, to get it. Mm. Interesting. I mean, this these lessons are easy to say in hindsight, right? But like, in the in the moment, what what are some of the mistakes that you made that, if you look back, you've either learned from or you do entirely differently? Oh, a lot. Plenty. Give us like top two or top three. Uh, contracts. Mm. Not signing contracts, regardless of how chummy we are as guys, um, because I learned early. Well, not too early. <laughs> at some but point. But I learned at some point that contracts aren't about trust. It's about clarity. So people will say, hmm. why are you giving me a contract if you trust me? That's like, I do one. trust you, but I want us to be clear, right? Mm -hmm. So what is my role? What is your role? What happens when both of us fulfill our roles and money starts coming in? What am I entitled to? Mm. And I think that's part of what people need to get comfortable discussing, even if it's your mom, yeah. right? Like, mom, how much of this money that's coming is mine? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a, Am I, am I the one that's going to be paying bills in the house? You know, these are all important questions you ask. And I think a lot of people don't do that. So contracts. And I think the second thing that I wasn't doing was I wasn't saving. Mm. I mean, I'm not, I'm comfortable. But, yo, I saw money in my 20s. <laughs> yo, I, look. <laughs> I, I, geez. Am I made money? Wiz made money. Um, Wiz and I, like, I don't know of his actual fee now. I know it's over a hundred thousand dollars or so. But I know at the time I managed him in 2013, 2014, we were doing we could fly to Dubai for a weekend and do like forty thousand dollars and come back, fifty thousand dollars. We'll go to South Africa to shoot a video. Not our video. We were flown <laughs> there. I remember sexy mama by yeah. yeah. Mm. Um the video was shot in essay. So Ubi and uh Inyanya flew me and Wiz to Joburg. On our way, I just told one promoter that we are coming. We landed in Joburg. I think we made thirty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> and that was then. That was like that was 20, 2013, 2014. We made thirty thousand dollars and left. <laughs> like we literally we didn't go there to work. We were just like, oh we're in town. We're like, oh we'll give you ten thousand dollars, we'll give you ten thousand, come to the club, come to my club. So three days we we're just doing clubs. And you know, so there was I Get saw money. money. And, you know, a lot of the times I just took care of issues, you know, mm. money was just a tool. Okay, there's a problem here, solve it, family here, ish. you know, I wasn't really saving. And so my, my advice to many people now is no matter how much money you think you're making in your 20s, you're broke. Hmm. That's, my, that's my advice to young guys now, all my mentees, everybody, I tell them, I don't care what you're making, I don't care how much you have, you're broke. Keep as much as you can, later on it will make sense. Mm. Yeah. That's a really good advice for everybody in this room right now. <laughs> um, so for managers, right, um, who are just getting in and they're not sure how to negotiate their fees or their commissions or when they get, what, what's your advice to them? Start with 10%. Why 10? Um, Why not 20? Because 10% normally is what a booking agent gets, yes, but you don't have leverage. Hmm. Depending on the artist you're talking to. If you have, I have a student who just signed a deal with, with the major label and for her artist, and she she's doing 20 percent with her artist but she's done the work you know what i mean so when the contract was being discussed she's like look we need to sign my contract right and this is what i want for what i'm offering and you know she she, she kept me informed throughout the process and i was laughing because geez you're doing better than <laughs> i was then you know what i mean and yeah. and so there's 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 that understanding you you know start build your leverage mm. provide solutions you know, be the guy that is relevant, be the person that people want to talk to. And then over time, you're able to, not, your relevance now puts you in a position where you're able to say, this is what I want. You mm. know, this is, I mean, I, I can't imagine an artist telling me what I will earn when we have a conversation. It's not going to happen. If we, if we we'll just shake hands and be like, you know, what, let's meet at the club <laughs> and hang out <laughs> on our regular times. Yeah. But it's that you build that reputation over time. And as you build your reputation, you begin, people, Stop. They won't even argue with you when you tell them what your fee is because mm. they've seen the work you've done as mm. opposed to constantly just reminding people 
what you're entitled to when you're not actually entitled to it right right that's amazing so let's talk about music business academy for yeah. africa yeah um, at what point did you say you know what i'm just i don't want to just like be the manager and you know work with artists i want to sort of like help the people who would then work with artists it started in 2016 so i was i went to my lawyers and they told me yeah you need to shut down your company i was like why They're like everything you're doing is wrong oh wow so i'm like so what are these guys been teaching me you know, and I was really angry for a while, but then I started thinking, so what about the guys coming? Mm. Like, is this how we're going to just leave this thing? So I started doing this thing called Music Business Series on Twitter. And, you know, just bringing people I'd met, people I knew, like, oh, you come, you know, Tiny Tempers manager, mm. Emma's manager, uh, Asha's manager. I'd be like, guys, come, let's, let's have a Twitter session. Um, so we talked about management, talked about... CMOs talked about music and the law, etc. Um, and then in 2017, I went on tour. So I went to universities, went to different cities. I did Lagos, Abuja, Ibadan, Uyo, um, Kampala, Joburg. You know, I went to a few places and I was speaking to young people and students about the music industry and education for people. And I realized that a lot more people wanted it. People were even telling me, look, I'll pay you mm. to actually be part of what you're doing. And so I started the training program when I saw people were willing to pay. Yeah. Uh, so the training program then morphed into the academy last year. Amazing. So what's like the traction so far? How is it going? And what Great. Are the plans? Last year, last year we did about 140 people, and this year we did 150 at double the price. Mm. So last year we did three modules. This year we did six modules, and then we've added an element of practicality so there's actually a talent project within right. the program so we've released an EP already another EP is coming in November and that's what they finished classes so now mm. what they're doing is working on so how long does it take so it's about four four months right uh, so just three months of teaching but in that they're working and then they have one month and a half to actually now release music properly because the first release is practice Mm. Now nah, this is when they But work. it's not your music they're releasing, right? No, is so it? the talent project. Right. We find five writers, five producers, and five artists. And then we get them to work with each other. Mm. So when the five artists come, the first song they release is their original song, the song that they wrote and submitted. We just clean it up, mix it, master it, master the song, and then we help them market. Right. But the second one is written by the writers within the program and produced by the producers within the program. Right. So that way we're giving people an opportunity to not only just learn but also Actually let's market so imagine 160 people pushing your music yeah <laughs> that's, that's that's massive so the first ep what was the success of that um so far i mean the, the, the success i see i knew that it wouldn't do a lot because they're all new artists they're all known artists mm. so i knew that it wouldn't do a lot but it was a good introduction because people were like the feedback was really good the mixing was great the the vocals were good the artists were good so there's, <coughs> excuse me, there's potential. Where I'm really focused on is the next one. Yeah, that's, I'd, I'm waiting to see what comes of that. That's amazing. I mean, so we started this interview talking about your background. Um, I remember you saying that two key things that you learned from your dad was one, that there's reward for hard work, the mm -hmm. chicken. Yeah. And of course, don't ever beat a woman. Yeah. But what are the other lessons can you remember from your mom and your dad that, that you still hold really <coughs> dear and has shaped in one way or the other your career so far? My mom was, mom was selfless. But one of the things, I remember a story about, um, so my mom was, my mom was in an accident mm. and her boss, uh, an American called Robert Stano, was, you know, he came to the hospital, you know, he was like, okay, he'll pay the bill. So my mom was like, ah, let me tell you how much my mom was earning. This is not like 1992. This is 2000 and <laughs> this, is, this is not too far ago. <laughs> yeah, she was earning 8,000 a month. Oh, wow. Yeah, and so um, so this guy comes in, he's, he's like, he's going to cover the bill. So my mom, I mean, we're happy, but curious. And he tells my mom that the reason why he's doing this is because, well, she's never stolen from him. You know, um, he has a camera and like she doesn't touch his drinks. And she's like, 
you pay me a salary. Mm -hmm. I, I drink, if I want to drink beer, I know I can buy it, right? So I don't need to yeah. touch your stuff. After that day, the man just said, you know what, feel free to take beer from my fridge <laughs> if you want. You know, so those, that, those types of situations re taught me about integrity, right? Mm. There is reward. You might not see it coming, but there is reward for it. As ridiculous as it sounds, you know, beer. Yeah. But the reality is there are so many things, opportunities that I've been introduced to simply because I didn't mess up. Mm. the situation when it was really really small when it was really irrelevant mm. and so th that that was something i learned from my mom as well uh, they didn't my mom and my dad to be honest they didn't live above their means um they focused on their kids but i don't know how they did it on the salaries that they were on but i mean it's paid off because <laughs> my current where i live now my mom used to work there wow yeah, so, you know, it's, it's nice. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to have those types of situations and stories. Yeah. Um, and I think another thing, no matter how poor we were, my father didn't treat us like we were poor. That's why I said mm. my childhood was pretty, yeah. pretty cool. Um, we didn't have money. But, like, my mom worked so hard, her bosses would buy us, like, uh, I learned to speak English by watching Bambi and <laughs> Little Mermaid and, and Jungle Book. You know what I mean? Like they gave us those things. Maybe they were buying new stuff. Their kids were done watching. They just hand it over to us. Uh, my dad ensured that we went to school. Like just those little things yeah. that don't seem important to you as a kid then. And then you realize how important it was to shaping who you are. Amazing. So this is my final question. Um, most of the questions I asked about just like live lessons were specifically for people who want to work in the music industry, managers. But I think that there are lots of skills that are transferable and lots of experience that are transferable. Yeah. So for people who are just aspiring to be entrepreneurs, regardless of like what industry, if they can't take anything else for this interview, what is that one thing that you want to just tell aspiring or want to be entrepreneurs? Learn. That's the first thing. When you decide what you want to do, learn about it. Mm practice what you learn right because that's the only way that you get to be good at it then when you practice it enough you're going to start providing solutions solutions don't necessarily mean you created anything new mm -hmm. it just means that you can solve the problem that exists mm. um, with existing methods or yeah. tools and when you provide solutions on a regular basis what starts happening is you become relevant mm. what you do with relevance is what brings you wealth this is a journey you take it doesn't just happen so yeah. my advice whether it's business in music, business in fashion, whatever it is, these five steps are the steps I personally live by. And I think those are the things that will guide you. And the funny thing about the first part is it continues yeah. until the end. Yeah. You have to continue learning. So learn. Learn. Practice. practice. When you practice, you provide we'll solutions. Provide solutions. When you provide solutions, Get it makes relevant. you relevant. And what you do with relevance gives you wealth. Well. Amazing. And I think that's how we're going to end this video, guys. If you forget anything, always remember these five steps. Thank you so much for watching this video to the end. Make sure you don't leave this channel without subscribing. And I'll see you in another video. Peace out.